Good morning. We are called into a time of worship this morning here at New Philadelphia Moravian Church and all over the place at New Philadelphia Moravian Church by these words from Psalm 145. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. We join together today in the liturgy for national occasions. the Lord all you nations extol him all you peoples for great is his steadfast love toward us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever praise the Lord the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it the world and those who live upon it let all people everywhere know that the supreme God has power over the human kingdom and that he can give it to anyone he chooses even to the least important the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Praise the Lord. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. God, ruler of nations, to whose grace we owe the manifold blessings of this land, we worship you with grateful hearts. We confess that in many ways we have turned aside from your commandments, and it is because of your steadfast love that we are not consumed. You offer us mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against you 
and have not obeyed your command to walk in your laws which you have set before us. Lord, have mercy on us and blot out our transgressions. We pray, Lord, that you will guide and bless all who are in places of authority. Protect them from violence and fill the hearts of the people with respect and love for them because you have established their authority. Raise up for us leaders who will carry out all your purpose and in patience and courage will depend on you. Save your people and bless your heritage. Make of this nation an instrument for the promotion of peace, freedom, and righteousness. May it be a haven for the oppressed of other lands, a home of happiness for all who dwell within its borders, and may our commitment to liberty and justice for all be preserved for generations to come. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Guide us and our leaders through the spirit of Christ's love as we struggle with matters of teaching and learning, home and family, health and security, work and justice. Turn the hearts of all people to you that they may seek eternal life through Jesus Christ, who redeems us and our world. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Grant wisdom to those who are of the family of faith. Enable us to accept the authority of government for your sake, ready for every good work, abstaining from every form of evil, and paying to all whatever is due to them. As citizens of this nation, may we bring credit to our Savior in all we do. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Grant to the people of this and all other lands a love of peace and order, that the nations shall learn war no more. Hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Amen. Last Sunday, you welcomed me, and now this Sunday, it is my joy to welcome you. And the first thing that I need to say to all of you is, 
please be patient with me as I try to learn more and more about this church so that I can share that news with you. There will certainly be things that need to be said or shared that I will unintentionally leave out. And please don't hesitate to let me know, in a nice way, of course. And please refer to the newsletter, the website, the Facebook page, staff, and other members to make sure you know what you need to know. For example, I did not know that July and August have been designated as casual dress months, and I did not dress accordingly, but now I have been instructed, and I will keep that in mind. Some of you, I'm sure, are in your pajamas, but we won't do that here. I do know that next Sunday, we will celebrate the Festival of John Huss, with Holy Communion. It will be offered virtually as part of our 10 o'clock service, and we will also have a drive-in communion beginning at noon. Details of how this is done will be shared throughout the week, and again next Sunday during our live stream service. Lorena and I thank all of you for the wonderful welcome that we received last Sunday. It was good to see many of you in the drive through parade, and hopefully we'll remember what you look like when we see you without your masks. The regathering team has been meeting and the joint boards will meet this week, so we look forward to having some helpful information and guidance as we go through the next few weeks. What I can assure you is that one way or another, we will be worshiping God, proclaiming God's word, and continuing to find ways to live, love, and serve like Jesus. Speaking of serving, Michael Crane has provided some good news from the blood drive this past Monday. He says the success of our blood drive is this, that over 50 of you rolled up your sleeves to produce 46 units of blood, that in the midst of a pandemic that has sent too many of our friends and neighbors to the hospital, you washed your hands, put on your mask, and waited patiently six feet or more apart for the person ahead of you to send their blood on its way to a hospital where the life-saving work of our medical community can continue. Thank you for your selfless donation and the work of ministry and our partnership with the American Red Cross. Our next blood drive will be October 19th, and everyone who gave it this drive will be eligible to give again. If you have questions about the antibody testing on your donation, please contact the American Red Cross. And I will have a couple of other things that I will mention when we get into our prayer time. But right now, Clyde has some news to share. morning and thanks for giving me an opportunity to give you a quick update on our blessing box. Thanks to Joey Transu for posting a picture of the box and information about it to Next Door South Fork. As a result, visibility has, um, has raised and more food is being placed in and taken out every day um, with the neighborhood fully embracing it. In fact, I wanted to read to you um, a comment that someone posted just this week. She said, we were so blessed today. As we added items to the blessing box, we felt joy. Jesus told us to love thy neighbor as thyself. Thank you for building and putting up the box so that we all have an opportunity to give so that others may receive. Don't you love that we have invited the community in this way to join us in ministry to the poor and the struggling? Um, what, a, what a great blessing that blessing box continues to be. By the way, as I came to work this morning, or came to church, um, I noticed that the blessing box is almost empty. It's a great sight because it means that food's being taken out regularly, um, but it's even better to know that the firehouse has a great inventory of food, and I'll be filling that up um, after church today. Another way that we continue to reach out to our community is through our Benevolence Fund. Now, because many people have assumed that the church is closed, which it isn't, um, and also because our landlords and utilities companies have been lenient or offered um, assistance during these last few months, things have been quiet on the benevolence front until this past week when we did receive several calls. On Thursday, I had an appointment with a woman who came um, asking for assistance with her electric bill. During our time together, she volunteered information about many of her struggles, which include an eight-year-old with some serious chronic health concerns, and also the fact that she had just received a job in January, which she, um, of course, lost um, in the first of March. And so she's been without 
without any work during that time. Um, a criminal past doesn't help in getting a job and trying to sustain a life for herself. And I was so grateful um, as we entered this week that for a few moments we could offer her freedom from judgment and from worry and distress and utter hopelessness. And I thank you, all of you who have been supporting this Benevolence Fund for offering us the chance to remind people um, the words that were read right at the very beginning of this service. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And we're able to live out those words here at New Philadelphia through your generosity and through the Benevolence Fund. So thank you so much. Thank you, Clyde. And what a blessing it is to be part of this blessing. This past Thursday, I took part in a prayer meeting via Zoom with guests from different parts of the world. And we heard about situations in Africa and Europe and the Caribbean and Central and South America and here in North America. And many of the situations sounded similar to what we are facing here as, as part of the body of Christ as we continue to, to struggle with the best way to be able to keep on doing what we do as, as God's people. There's some good news from Tanzania because we hear that Moravians there, and there are a bunch of them, they're praying for us here every Sunday. And many of them, we hear, have turned to God and have gotten closer to Jesus in these difficult times. It's been a time of reflection. You may not know that Myanmar, that we sometimes are formally called Burma, is a developing mission area of the Moravian Church. And they are asking for our prayers. They've been spared the brunt of the, the COVID pandemic, but they're facing a civil war and economic hardship. And so we pray for them. Closer to home, we lift up those of our members who are hospitalized or battling illnesses at, at home or grieving the loss of a loved one. We lift up the Andrews family this morning. I was just informed this morning that Sister Colleen Ziegler passed away last night, and so we also lift up her um, family and, and loved ones in, in our prayers. We'll spend a moment in silent prayer, and I ask that if you have any prayer requests, you would either lift them up in your heart or place them in the comment section of the live stream if it's something that you want to share. I will not see them there, but it will give you an opportunity to lift up prayers for each other. And we pray that God would bring healing and peace in our nation and in God's world. So after a moment of praying silently together, we will be reminded that there is peace in Christ. Let us pray.
There is peace in Christ when we walk with Him through the streets of Galilee to Jerusalem. And the broken hearts try the tear-filled eyes when we peace in Christ, and that makes it possible for us to be at peace with each other and for us to find peace in the midst of challenging situations. You know, after the resurrection, the disciples were huddled in the upper room with the doors locked. They were afraid, and Jesus came in and said, peace be with you. They felt like they were locked in. We may feel like we're locked out, but Christ offers us that same peace, and we share it with each other. So take a moment right now and picture someone in your mind who you think might need that peace at this moment and either just wish them that peace in your mind and in your prayers or even write a comment if you would like to or smile or wave at someone around you and say the peace of Christ be with you peace of Christ be with you the peace of Christ be with you and with (laughs) y'all And just a reminder that offerings can be mailed to New Philadelphia Moravian Church at 4440 Country Club Road in Winston-Salem. That's 27104. And you can also give your offering online. There are two secure giving portals at newphilly.org. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the many blessings that we have in you we know that your mercies as your word says are new every morning and we pray that as we have been blessed that you would be able to make of us a blessing and use our gifts and our lives to bless others in jesus name amen Oh, 
reading from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today, today I declare that I will restore to you double. And we sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. gospel reading, the good news this morning, is from Matthew chapter 11, first reading verses 16 to 19. Jesus said, but to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance, we wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls." For my yoke 
is easy and my burden is light. Good morning, and let's let the children gather around, and adults, you can listen in too if you want to. 
Lately, how many of, of you have experienced something that makes you tired? Seeing people be mean to each other. Maybe online you could be saying something as simple as, wow, it's a pretty day outside. And someone else just looking for a chance to act ugly start a flood of mean comments. It's like what Jesus was talking about in the passage that, that Pastor Sam just read. John came, and he didn't eat like other people or drink wine, and people say, he has a demon. But the Son of Man came, eating, drinking wine, and people say, look at him, he eats too much and drinks too much. Ugh, people are looking to act ugly, and it's just kind of exhausting. Or we may be tired from news of injustice that we can't fix on our own, or coronavirus, or money's tight. Or will school start like normal in the fall? Etc. Oh my goodness. With each thing that's added, we get more and more and more tired and stressed. Wait. Stop. Take a breath. And listen in the quiet. Think back to when you were little. I mean really little. What did you do when you got stressed, or scared, or hurt? You crawled up on mom or dad's lap. You nestled into a comfy blanket or their robe, and you hid. And when you did, you found comfort, and you breathed in peace. And when you were calmed and rested and quieted, you climbed back down again and went on about your day. This is what Jesus is inviting us to do. Grab that comfy blanket. Crawl into Father God's lap in quiet. And with your heart in prayer, listen. And Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads and I will give you rest. Accept my work and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. Wow. Jesus knew that we'd be tired. He knows that we can feel stressed, and he's inviting us into the blanket in his father's lap. We can hide there. We can nestle in his robe and find comfort and breathe in peace until we're calmed and rested and quiet and ready to climb down again and go on about our day. When we curl up with God and do the things that we're stressed about, or do the things that we're stressed about, do these go away? No, they're still there. But God provides the calm and the peace and the quiet strength that we need to put them in their place, to handle them with a calmer spirit and a quiet heart. And let them rest. Look back at Jesus' words for us this morning. Come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Accept my work and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. The work that I ask you to accept is easy. The load I give you to carry is not heavy. That last part, 
What does he mean? The work that I ask you to accept is easy. The load I give you to carry is not heavy. The work he asks you to accept is to invite others to turn to God and to climb up in his lap too. To wrap up in that blanket and find comfort and breathe in God's peace. Just like he promised, that's not too heavy. That's not a job that's too difficult for us to accept. So when you feel tired or stressed or a little scared, remember, crawl up in God's lap in prayer. Wrap yourself in that comfy blanket of his presence. Stay until you're calmed and rested and quieted. Then climb down, go out with a calmer heart and spirit and share your blanket with another. Amen. Today is a first for me because it's a second. Are you confused yet? What I mean is that you may remember that last Sunday I said I have preached here a few times in the past, but never two Sundays in a row. Well, this is the first Sunday that I'm preaching for a second Sunday here at New Philadelphia. And I thought it might be good to share with you a little bit about the process that I like to use for getting ready to preach a sermon. On Monday morning, or as early in the week as possible, I read the assigned scripture selections for the following Sunday. 
And you will find that I do like to use those assigned readings. Now, I'm not tied to them or, or bound by them. For example, if I would decide to do a series focusing on one book of the Bible, I could certainly do that, but I would really prefer to do that in a Bible study. And please stay tuned over the next couple of weeks because I'll be saying more about some ideas that I have related to having some sort of Bible study, whether it be in person or by Zoom or whatever. But for sermons, I really like to let God surprise me with the word for the week. And this week, I think we'll see that God's word for the week is also God's word for the weak, the weary and exhausted. Well, on Monday morning, I look at the readings as part of my personal devotional time to see what they say, first of all, to me. What do I need to hear? What is God saying to me? It's kind of like that hymn, Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of your word. So I write down my initial thoughts or reactions or responses to what I've read. And then for the next couple of days, I try to look at the world and look at life through the filter, or I guess I should say through the lens of those passages. And I try to make observations and notice connections to the real world, and then I write those down, and hopefully not too late in the week, they come together into what I then stand up here and say to all of you, in other words, the sermon. Well, I looked at two of the readings for today, the passages in Zechariah and Matthew that we heard, and I opened up a document to start writing down my thoughts and observations, and I wrote Sunday, July 5th, and the first thing that I noticed was the date, today's date, July 5th. That means it comes right between July 4th and July 6th. Now, I know this is not earth-shattering news, but it is significant, I think, for Moravians here in the United States of America because July 4th, yesterday, is our Independence Day, and July 6th, tomorrow, is the day that we remember the martyrdom of John Huss, whose death eventually led the way to the birth of the Moravian Church, and we'll hear more about that next Sunday. So yesterday reminds us that, as was declared in 1776, these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. But then tomorrow, we're also reminded that as Moravians, we are joined together, not politically, but rather by our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, with ties that cannot be broken or dissolved, with brothers and sisters in well, Great Britain and Ireland and Germany and the Czech Republic and Tanzania and Cuba and Sierra Leone and Peru and about 40 countries in all. So this in-between day, July 5th, kind of represents where we are and who we are as Moravians in the United States of America. Well, when I looked at the reading from Zechariah in chapter 9, my first thought was that it seemed more like a passage for Palm Sunday or, or Advent. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he. But then I noticed that it's interesting that on the weekend that we are celebrating our independence, our freedom, we are reminded that we still do have a king. But his name isn't King George III. No, his name is King Jesus the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. And I turn to the reading in Matthew chapter 11. Now last week I mentioned that I like to think of Matthew chapter 10 as a mini mission manual. It's the chapter where Jesus gives his disciples instructions and then sends them out. I think it could be summed up in one word, go. But then comes chapter 11, which I believe could also be summed up in one word, but that word is come. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now maybe it's because it's July 4th weekend, but those words of Jesus, that invitation, reminded me of the words engraved on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Well, I focused on those words, weary and tired. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary. And the poem says, give me your tired, your poor. Now, I can't see all of you, 
But raise your hand if sometime in the past week you've said, I'm just tired of, and fill in the blank. I'm just tired of reading or hearing about such and such, or I'm just tired of seeing whatever, or I'm just tired of the way that so-and-so always does such and such, or I'm just tired of doing this or being this, or I'm just tired of not doing this or not being this. You might even say, I'm just tired of being tired. But then comes that word, that beautiful word, that welcomed word, rest. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. And he says, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Rest and rest for your souls. I think of that as physical rest and spiritual rest. And we see in Scripture that God offers us both of those things. Physical rest seems to have been important right from the beginning because in the creation story we read that even God rested on the seventh day and God established this concept of Sabbath rest. Our bodies need that. We need that. But Jesus also offers spiritual rest, rest for our souls. In Scripture, rest and peace are often connected. I think it's interesting that we tend to connect them mainly in death. We say, may he rest in peace. But we need that in life. We need to rest in the peace that only Jesus can offer us. A peace that passes all human understanding. But it's a peace that can keep our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. A peace that provides true rest. So in the midst of all of this, there was another word that jumped out at me in the reading. Yoke. And I thought, didn't we deal with that last week? Didn't Hananiah take the yoke off of Jeremiah's shoulders and smash it? But here it is again. And isn't it strange that Jesus says, come to me all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. But then he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you. Wait, what? Which is it? Is he going to give us rest or give us a yoke? It seems almost contradictory. And how is a yoke good news? It's kind of like if I would go up to one of you who are members of the congregation and I'd say, you've been working really hard lately. You're on a lot of committees and you have the added burden of the present situation and coping with all of this, and you teach Sunday school, and you're on the board of trustees, plus you've got your family and your day job, I think you need a break. I think you need some rest. And you'd be thinking, thank you. Finally, someone understands. But then I'd say, oh, and one more thing. Could you organize some small groups and, and put together some promotional videos for, for some of our ministries? And I could just see the, the, the air kind of going out of you and you would physically slump down and manage a half smile and say, okay, pastor, I'll, I'll try my hardest. But that's not what Jesus was saying. The people in those days were very familiar with yokes. The common people often labored wearily under Roman occupation and the ruling elite secured wealth and status and power at the expense of the lowly. But besides the political yoke, there was the religious yoke. Their faith should have sustained them and strengthened them, comforted them as they faced that oppressive political yoke, but instead sometimes their religion just added to the burden. Too often it was a religion of rules and legalistic regulations with very little mercy and love and kindness. Jesus said that the Pharisees tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others. People were tired of having to try so hard to do everything right and get everything right. So they knew about yokes. They also knew about physical yokes from watching the oxen out in the fields. And many of them worked out in the fields as well. They knew that if an ox was plowing a field, there were two things that could add to the burden or make it harder to bear. One was if the ox would be yoked with what we might call a sorry ox. An ox that, that didn't pull its weight or carry its share of the burden. That would make it a lot more difficult. But you see, when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, that wasn't an added burden. No, he was saying, you're doing all of these things that I've asked you to do, but you don't have to do them alone because I'm inviting you to take my yoke, to be yoked with me, to let me be your partner in doing these things. And you can even learn from me as we do them together. You're not on your own and you don't have to go it alone. So following Jesus' example, I wouldn't say to someone in the congregation, you're already doing all of these things and now I want you to do more. 
No, I'd say you're already doing all of these things and I want to do them with you. And maybe you can learn from me as we do them together and I can learn from you. And trust me, Jesus does a much better job with that than I do. So you see, Jesus doesn't remove the yoke or shatter the yoke, but he does offer to share the yoke, to share the burden, share the work of ministry. And talk about a dream team, you and Jesus working together. He calls us to serve, but we serve in the strength that he gives. And the burden only becomes overbearing when we try to bear it all alone. But the other thing that could add to the burden for an ox was if the, was if the yoke didn't fit well. That would cause unnecessary blistering and, and discomfort and, and pain. So the farmer would measure the ox and then use those measurements to make a rough model of the yoke out of wood. And then they would try it on and adjust it so that it fit well. And it wouldn't bruise or blister the ox. It was tailor-made, and that made the load seem lighter. Well, Jesus says that his yoke is tailor-made for us. In the English translation, it says, my yoke is easy. But the word in Greek that's translated easy in English is krestos. And it literally means fit for use, manageable, well-fitting. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our strengths and our weaknesses, and he calls us to serve with the gifts that God has given us. And he gives us a task that fits with who we are. And maybe one of my tasks as pastor is to try to make sure that the ministries that each of you have taken on are tailor-made for you and for who you are, and that you and Jesus are sharing the load. So can you see that this offer of a yoke, when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, can you see that it really is good news? It really is a way of finding rest for our bodies and for our souls. Because Jesus is not laying an additional burden on our shoulders. No, Jesus is inviting us to share our burdens with him. To stop trying to take on these burdens alone and to face them together, yoked with him. And finally, Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. All. All. Someone has said that all is a small word that speaks to the bigness of the gospel. This invitation is extended to all kinds of people. People like us and people who aren't like us. Even people who don't like us. And we don't always agree on everything. That seems to be part of our human nature. Now, I'm not an expert on American history, but I know that on Tuesday, July 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress, meeting in Philadelphia, passed a resolution to declare independence from Great Britain. And on Thursday, July 4th, 1776, the actual Declaration of Independence was approved and signed by some and sent to the printers. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson worked on this together. And they and others accomplished this amazing thing that we still celebrate 244 years later. But John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had lots of disagreements. They couldn't even agree on which date should be celebrated. Adams thought it should be July 2nd, and Jefferson said July 4th. Or how it should be celebrated. Adams wanted pomp and parades and bells and bonfires. But Jefferson wrote, let the annual return of this day forever refresh our recollections of these rites and an undiminished devotion to them. Of course, we know that as North Carolina Moravians, we settled it in 1783 by celebrating July 4th with a love feast in Salem and having the choir sing a cantata for that occasion. But allow me one last little bit of history. Because I've read that even though Adams and Jefferson had major disagreements, and their followers in two different political parties kept those disagreements alive, when Thomas Jefferson's wife died, John and Abigail Adams seemed to put those differences aside, and they frequently invited him to their home, knowing that he needed a friend. Well, that didn't last forever because the election in 1800 reminded them of their differences and pulled them apart once more. And they really continued that way until, interestingly, they both died on July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of our independence, or two days after it, if you ask John Adams. Jesus offers us a rest and a peace that transcends these kinds of differences. We get glimpses of that rest, that peace, in the midst of tragedy. 
when someone dies or there's a disaster, we, we all come together and for a brief moment we find peace. We get glimpses of that peace when we have a shared purpose, like working together for the freedom and independence of a nation, or working together as a congregation in response to God's commission to make disciples of all nations. And we can get even greater glimpses when we respond to this invitation to come to him. Because the only way that we can get closer to each other is by getting closer to him. The only way we can find rest for our souls is if we are connected to him, yoked with him. And my prayer is that as individuals, as a congregation, as a denomination, and as a nation, we might find this rest and this peace as we all come to him and learn from him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this invitation to come to you and to let you share with us and we share with you this burden that we all bear. We thank you for this well-fitting yoke that you provide for us. And we pray that we would get closer to you so that we can be closer to each other and closer to your purpose for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord of all nations, grant me grace to love all people, every race. you to join me in continuing the custom and practice of, of lifting a hand. I lift my right hand for this congregation and at the same time I lift another hand for our nation. And I would ask today, we usually we lift them for all kinds of reasons, but I think it would be great if all of us would do that. Lift one hand for our, our congregation and one hand for, for our nation. And we will lift up our nation in prayer and ask God's blessing on it at this moment. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion and fellowship and peace and rest of the Holy Spirit be with us and be with all. Amen. 